Well, hello, boys and girls. Those who bounce in between, it's Comrade Danky here coming at you today with sort of part two on my handy dandy guide of organizing in real life. So, the first big question we sort of ran into when we were trying to set up our first organization, the Progressive Student Alliance, was do we want our organization to be a Big Ten organization? Meaning, we let people in of a, a large range of different ideologies, sometimes contradictory ideologies. Uh, we would let in liberals. We would let in anarchists. We would let in Trotskyists. We would let in Marxist-Leninists. We would let in Maoists. We would let in pretty much anybody and everybody. And that is the basis of the big tent organizational structure they uh, in theory believe that if the organization allows people of all walks of life and all different types of ideologies uh, to become members then your membership will be boosted you'll be more popular as a result the opposing theory to this is uh, no our organization needs to be guided by a single unifying theory uh, we need to have consensus about certain issues certain topics uh, and we can have debate within the organization about minor things but when it comes to major issues we need to have a uh, sound theory that we all believe in guiding our organization and the reason why I argue I argue for this form of organization is because if you have a centralized theory then everybody will be on the same page when it comes to tackling certain issues uh, you won't get uh, the liberals telling you oh just be nice to the fascist and maybe they'll turn good versus you know the traditional far-left approach of Nazis deserve uh, a knuckle sandwich or at the very least an ice cream cone uh, to the face so with that difference of approach you have a hesitation in action and I'll explain later on but action is the most important thing you can do as an organization action is the key and so any hesitation on taking action that comes from a difference of ideological opinion within your group, uh, a difference in theory, a difference on how to go forward, well then that is going to impede your organization's ability to actually do stuff and make a difference out there. So if you have uh, consensus and agreements on certain key tenets, for example, like this group is uh, against capitalism, then if, if you stick to that tenant and if you hold everybody to that tenant, you don't let any capitalist in the group, any pro-capitalist propaganda in the group, then your group would be much more effective at combating capitalism than a group that did allow the occasional capitalist apologist to sneak in. Another thing we learned is organizing along democratic centralism. Now a lot of people hear that and they think, oh, it's just some buzzword. But it's really a whole philosophy on how to organize and prevent factionalization, blah, I can't speak, factionalization within your organizational structure. Democratic centralism can be expressed in the motto, diversity in thought, uh, unity in action so essentially it encourages debate it encourages people to have different thoughts different opinions different ideas but once a decision is made and reached democratically by the entire group that decision is binding to everybody so let's say that a measure passes that you don't specifically like uh, they want to hold an event at a location that you don't really like this means that 
in the event that that measure is passed, it's still binding to you. You still have to support that event. You can't, uh, you know, try to boycott it. You have to go along with it. You have to go along with the majority. And this doesn't mean that you can't bring up uh, grievances later, but you have to do that through official channels. All of this is to prevent people from talking behind uh, each other's backs, uh, gossiping, backstabbing, and essentially splintering and splitting away into factions. So democratic centralism is the key in running a left-wing organization. Uh, another key is having transparent leadership. Uh, we learned this the hard way. Uh, the leadership of my previous organization was uh, essentially unaccountable and not transparent whatsoever. This led to a lot of lying, uh, a lot of gaslighting, and uh, essentially a breakup and a slow dissolution in any kind of left-wing unity that could have been achieved uh, in our movement. So this lack of uh, unaccountable, non-transparent, uh, this, this lack of accountable, transparent leadership led uh, my entire previous organization, the Progressive Alliance, to go down in flames. So transparent leadership is absolutely critical in having an organization. Make sure that uh, if a representative of your organization is speaking to another organization, there is a transcript of what was said or a recording. That way, if it comes, if, if things turn nasty and it comes to a game of he said, she said, you don't have to take people just on their words. You can have uh, physical evidence there with you. Uh, or better yet, just bring some of the other officers along with you for negotiations. Don't have secret conversations that uh, you are completely, uh, you know, going without recording anything or documenting anything. We just had to go by your word as to what was said. So, when it comes to having a transparent leader, when it comes to having democratic centralism, you have to talk about, uh, and, and when it comes to having a unifying theory, you have to talk about discipline and you have to talk about vetting. So what do you do with people who are, say, officers and they start going against the grain? They start going against the measures that were taken, going against the vote. Uh, they are defying the democratic centralist process and they need to be disciplined either by being removed from whatever committee they're in or being banned from the club entirely. Uh, as far as a leader acting without counsel or without transparency, they need to be stripped of their leadership position immediately for the sake of survival of the entire organization. And when it comes to vetting, you should err on the side of caution you shouldn't be so selective that you wouldn't allow uh only but like one or two or three people in your group that's obviously stupid but you should take care to uh let people in who are actually comrades who have an understanding at least a basic understanding of marxist leninist theory you can always, you know, bring them in with the idea of educating them later, but they have to have a certain foundation. We have to make sure that they are on the same page as us with certain key issues before we let just any Tom, Dick, and Harry into the fucking group. Because you don't want to get into a situation where you're on the central planning committee with a bunch of libs. All right? That's not how it should work. So vet your members and have party discipline. Be prepared to kick people out. It's It sucks, but it's just the way it's got to be to keep the train chugging. And this is 
probably the most important point you can listen to. If, if you don't get anything else out of this video, listen to what I'm about to say next. Be in touch with the working class. Don't be disconnected. Don't just be some, you know, group of elitist assholes who, who sit with their theory books and they talk about uh, Das Kapital and they talk about how uh, bad capitalist society is, but all of their solutions are completely unfeasible. <laughs> their solution is something like well if the USSR was still around maybe we would have a chance no this is 2019 the USSR isn't here you have to focus on the material conditions that you have now and uh, chances are your humble organization isn't going to lead the proletarian revolution anytime soon so start off with realistic goals achievable goals goals that uh, capture the desires of the local proletariat. For example, in my town, there's a real push for a fight for $15 minimum wage on campus. That seems like a natural, feasible goal for a Marxist organization to push for. Uh, it's a goal that most of the working class, I'm sure a majority of campus workers, would easily rally behind. So why not push for a goal like that instead of push for some, you know, broad amorphous goal like let's abolish capitalism? Okay, how? What's your one, two, three step process? Uh, until you have that step process, you know, shut the fuck up <laughs> but you want to ask what's your one two three step process for accomplishing a local feasible goal well then that's a very easy thing to do and that's something that even a small organization could take the helm and lead that charge so reach out to your fellow proletarians find out their grievances find out their working conditions Find out the things that they want and then push for those things. Medicare for all, a Green New Deal, free college tuition, decreased college tuition, a higher minimum wage. These are all feasible, realistic goals that we as humble Marxist organizations can push for and accomplish. So make sure that your goals are realistic. Have a plan. Now it doesn't have to be, you know, down to a science but have goals and have plans that you can accomplish have a time frame have people set aside to work on different facets of those plans don't just leave it all up to one person to do all the work after all you're an organization delegate to people uh, find people to take different uh, to assume different roles in certain events if somebody wants to make decorations, have them make decorations. If someone wants to produce propaganda, have them produce propaganda. I'll get more into that in a bit. Um, almost in, as important as being in touch with the working class is forging smart alliances. Um, your local unions. Uh, immigrants rights groups, gay rights groups, uh, there are various different organizations, including Marxist organizations, that would, I'm sure, love to partner up with another fellow Marxist organization. So all that uh, being said, you have to have positions of which you're not willing to compromise on. You can partner up with an organization that might be capitalist if they respect your sovereignty, they don't try to inject any of their pro-capitalist bullshit into you, but if they are, for example, taking money from the Koch Brothers Foundation or some other far-right group, the Ayn Rand Institute, then obviously you're making a deal with the devil and you shouldn't ally with somebody like that. Don't um, form a coalition 
with a group that could potentially sink your own organization. Uh, don't form a coalition with a group that could violate your own group's uh, uh, sovereignty. Don't form a coalition with a group that uh, holds uh, core values contradictory to your own. So don't go out and form an alliance with a conservative group just because it might be temporarily convenient. You should have positions of no compromise. We don't negotiate with fascists. We don't debate fascists. We don't uh, work with fascists. You know, just something like that. Uh, so make smart alliances, but also take smart actions. If an action is risky, you have to assess the potential gains you have from taking that action. For example, if you're doing a protest against a government organization like ICE, you have to estimate, all right, what is the likelihood that our protest will be effective, that it will communicate our message to a wide audience, that it will have some kind of positive effect on the immigrant community here in in the city and then also what's the likelihood that uh, our people are gonna get arrested what's the likelihood that something violent could happen and the police could react violently uh, what is the likelihood that we could be smeared by the mainstream media so you have to ask yourself uh, a, a cost uh, benefit analysis of any action that your group does. In short, you want to maximize your gains while minimizing your losses. So to that effect, you have to be sure that when you take an action, when you do a protest, when you do an event, when you host a certain speaker, you are willing to deal with the consequences of that. And you need to come to an assessment. Is it worth it? Because there are some battles, ladies and gentlemen, I'll tell you this, it's not worth fighting. There are others which most certainly are worth fighting. So you have to understand. Uh, and you have to have sort of an awareness. You can't just sign up for every single thing that jumps onto your plate. You have to really take time and think and plan things through and say, do I really want to do this event? Do I really want to do this protest? Is it worth it or is it too risky? And another very, very, very important thing is that your action should be inspired by the theory that your organization is bound to. Your Marxist-Leninist organization t should take Marxist-Leninist style action inspired by Marxist-Leninism. We don't just read all these books for no reason. We read them to put what's written in those books into practice. And uh, practice is all that matters, folks. It, it's what matters at the end of the day. You can sit around reading theory until the fucking cows come home. It won't change Jack Diddley shit. You have to get out there in the field and fight for your meals. You have to convince the proletariat to join your cause. They're not going to do it by themselves. You have to convince them. Nobody else is going to do it. The media is not going to do it. Some other YouTuber is not going to do it. It has to be you. It cannot be anyone else. Because if you leave it to somebody else, well, that person, that proletariat, could get snatched up by some reactionary like Tucker Carlson or fucking Sargon of Akkad. So theory inspires action. And ultimately, the action is what matters. But also action in turn inspires an improved theory. When you do get out there in the field, when you get boots on the ground IRL and you fight for your meals, you will soon discover what is effective and what is not effective and you can uh, plan things out meticulously and you'll quickly learn that what happens in real life there are 
numerous factors that you did not account for and the circumstances will change and so your theory and your future action will have to change and adapt to those circumstances for example if every time you go to a protest a group of chuds show up throwing uh, PP balloons at you well then next time be prepared to bring some uh, lacrosse nets or something so you can catch those balloons and fling them back at them it's a pretty stupid example so you say okay Danky, you've ranted long enough I don't know what the fuck you're talking about I've been listening to you for 30 minutes now and you've just been running your mouth about a bunch of bullshit that doesn't even fucking matter I tuned into this video to see how to plan and organize uh, an actual organization and all of you've told me is some fucking stupid pro tips you're basically the leftist equivalent of Jordan Peterson's 12 rules to life you tell us a bunch of obvious shit that we should all know okay I'm going off on a tangent anyway this is this is how we're organizing our organization the communist union it's a committee structure so we have a central planning committee uh, consists of me and some of my other comrades we're democratically elected and we are responsible for drafting the semester plans we bring these forward to the entire group and we say hey this is what we think we should focus on this semester so for an example our proposed semester plan is focusing on Marxism 101 we're gonna have a series of seminars and workshops and book clubs to educate the general campus population and our own members for that matter about Marxist Leninist theory um, we're gonna have Q&A's and we were gonna finish the semester off by a big May Day uh, party that we were gonna have uh, you know and that was basically our semester plan so as the central planning committee we draft that we make sure that everybody's sticking to the rules we act as sort of the liaison between our organization and other organizations but of course we are transparent we're accountable to everybody and any semester drafts that we produce have to be approved by a majority vote so it's kept democratic uh, there's also an event committee they're responsible for organizing events protests speakers that kind of thing uh, there is an outreach committee they're responsible for managing emails social media and also just reaching out and communicating to other organizations acting as liaisons uh, there is the education committee they run the book club they reach out and find speakers to come have talks uh, and they are responsible for uh, educating new recruits on Marxist Leninism getting them caught up on theory there's also the committee on finance they manage the finances pretty self-explanatory but the reason we had this uh, committee structure it's because we quickly realized like if our membership grew very very large it was going to be taxing to try to involve every single member in the decision-making process this way with the committee structure they are given sort of the creative freedom to draft these plans and then present them to the group to be voted on and either approved or disapproved so it gives them creative freedom and it has a little something for everybody if you're a financial whiz join the financial committee if you're more into theory than actual you know boots on the ground action join the education committee uh, if you like being sort of a diplomat and a representative serve the outreach committee it's there are you know it's a little bit something for everybody and it's a way for members with different skill sets to use those skill sets for the betterment of the organization as a whole uh, I think this keeps it democratic keeps it transparent uh, keeps everybody involved everybody happy and it keeps it organized alright this way you're you'll be able to produce plans draft plans uh, and come up with different goals that you can accomplish easily 
we feel like this committee structure you know is the best way to do it going forward so that's essentially how uh, we have uh, worked to structure the communist union now going forward what are some of our plans well right now we're small as fuck so we are going to grow our membership going to do this through uh, our next semester plan marks 101 a series of seminars and book clubs and other outreach events uh, just to try to get people in we're also reaching out to other organizations like the party of communist USA uh, to try to build a coalition with other uh, like-minded and similar goal-oriented organizations so that is our first step our long-term goals is of course the proletariat revolution but we got to get there one step at a time comrades and that's how progress is made one step at a time uh, a castle is built a single brick at a time comrades and the castle of socialism has yet to get here uh, in the United States but hopefully what we're doing here is laying the foundational brickwork and if I can have even a small part in that well I would feel extremely humbled and extremely honored to do that so let me know what you think in the comments below uh, get up off your booty and make your own communist club today uh, you only you can prevent forest fires and only you can start uh, the socialist revolution it's not going to be anybody else. You have to do it. So go do it.